Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the CWS Wildlife Chronicles webinar. We're delighted to have you with us today. My name is Simran Prasad, and I'm a doctoral fellow at the Center for Wildlife Studies. Center for Wildlife Studies is a 38-year-old nonprofit organization with a focus in conservation science, wildlife research, education, and policy. We used to invite speakers to our office in Bangalore to talk about the latest topics in wildlife research, conservation, education, and policy. But because of the COVID situation, it's given us the opportunity to take this online, thereby taking it global. We launched CWS Wildlife Chronicles, and this will be our 35th webinar. Our past webinars have included discussions on a range of topics, such as zoonotic diseases, species conservation relating to elephants and tigers, to name a few, and research on bioacoustics. If you'd like to see our past webinars, you can visit our YouTube channel to view these. Today's webinar will also be recorded and available on our YouTube channel. If you wish to uh, contribute and support CWS initiatives and other similar outreach work that we do, you can use this QR code to donate. You can also visit our website at cwsindia.org or to get in touch with us, you can write to us at outreach at cwsindia.org. So let's delve into the topic of discussion for today's webinar. Collaborative conservation is an especially important topic that many people are passionate about. The ability to engage with people who have an involvement in conservation and who come from different backgrounds and experiences is an essential aspect of preserving, conserving and ensuring the future of fauna and flora, as well as identifying opportunities and benefits to local communities and a variety of stakeholders in diverse landscapes across the world. I'm sure all of us are intrigued to understand how collaborative conservation can drive action. And I'm excited to moderate what I'm sure will be an insightful discussion today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists. Dr. John Sanderson is the director of the Center for Collaborative Conservation in Colorado. Previously, Dr. Sanderson was based at the Nature Conservancy in Colorado for 14 years. The Center for Collaborative Conservation works to build the capacity of organizations, communities, and future leaders to achieve conservation impact while applying Colorado State University's world-class research and education. Welcome, Dr. Sanderson. Great to have you on this webinar. Thank you, Simran. It's great to be here. To complete our distinguished panel, we're delighted to have Dr. Terry Allendorf join us. Dr. Allendorf is an honorary fellow at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the Land Tenure Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has worked in Nepal, Myanmar, China, India, Uganda, Guyana, and Guatemala to develop the capacity of local and national NGOs to design and implement biodiversity conservation projects in collaboration with local communities. A very warm welcome, Dr. Allendorf. Thank you, Simran. And I'll just add that currently I am the executive director of community conservation, so. Oh, great, that's good to know. So CWS welcomes both our esteemed panelists. And the first question I think comes to mind is what is collaborative conservation exactly? Uh, based on your research and experience, what does collaborative conservation mean to you? So I'd like to open this question up to both of our panelists. Uh, could you share your thoughts on this, Dr. Allendorf? Um, sure, I'll go first. Um, so I actually tend to use the term community conservation uh, because I do work mainly in rural areas around the world where um, I think collaborative also works, but we tend to say community because we're trying to put the locus of power you know, with communities who are relying really heavily on the natural resources around them. And I think maybe it's be interesting to hear John's contrasting because I think collaborative, I ran into that term actually first when I interviewed, as I was telling John a few years ago at his center. Um, and I was like, why do you use the word collaborative out here? And so many places we say community. So I'll just stop there and let John add the collaborative piece on. Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Alendo. Uh, how about you, Dr. Sanson? What are your views on this? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Terry. Um, when I, uh, we, we have uh, one of the programs that we have here at the Center for Collaborative Conservation, we call the Western Collaborative Conservation Network. 
and it covers uh, we we cover most of the western states in the United States. Um, and we in in that network, we particularly focus on community based efforts. And um, similar to what we've already heard described briefly as, you know, involving the communities uh, in the area and looking out for uh, the, the needs of those communities at the same time that we're working on uh, on species and landscape protection is an essential component of that. Where I where I um, I, I bring another piece to this too, though, Terry, where um, uh, where I have uh, quite a bit of experience in efforts that are not really community based, but I still consider them deeply collaborative. And by collaborative, we mean that you know we're focused on natural resources, but we also are bringing in the full range of interests that are. Um, that are associated with those natural resources, whether the forests or water or species protection. And, um, and by bringing in those diverse in interests, we make sure that we're um, addressing the needs of people at the same time that we are um, addressing the needs of the species and the landscapes. But to give you an example of something that I'm working on right now, and Simran and I have talked about this actually, it's, um, the people of Colorado passed a law um, just about two years ago saying that uh, mandating that our state wildlife agency would reintroduce wolves to Colorado. And so this is a statewide initiative and it's going to happen. It's state law and um, a lot of people really, really dislike it, um, particularly our ag agricultural producers who uh, we grow a lot of we raise a lot of cattle and sheep in Colorado, and most cattle and sheep producers really dislike it. Now, we're doing a statewide um, uh, uh, planning for wolves in Colorado that um, I would say is, is most definitely not community-based, but I still consider it very much collaborative conservation because we are, um, we're thinking hard about, um, and and the state, to their credit, um, has constructed and is running a process that brings all of the interests to the table. So we're um, we're talking with we're talking about mix. We're talking about the the welfare of of cattle and sheep, and we're talking about uh, um, the the hunting industry that's that's really big here in Colorado. So even though we're not really located in a community, we're still um, bringing in that full range of interests. I will say one more thing that I think is really interesting, and Terry, you already mentioned this as well, around um, the locus of power, which I think um, I pay particular attention to in this business that we call collaborative conservation. And I work on a couple of different issues, including wolves, where you know the locus of power is actually pretty high. It's with the state wildlife agency or the state legislature or sometimes with the federal government. And so there's a state or federal law that's being imposed on the, re the state. And then the question I like to ask is how do we make sure the local communities across the region that are being impacted by that state or federal mandate are also have sufficient voice and sufficient power uh, to be able to uh, address their needs as well. And I guess I'll just add if I can that I do. So yeah, we focus more on communities and in most places where we work with rural communities, there's some form of tenure that local communities can have, right? And that's why the locus of power, you're trying to move it down to them. Like tenure over marine resources or forest resources through community forestry or whatever. But it doesn't mean that they do it alone, right? So then you start thinking about Eleanor Ostrom market and CBS in Bangalore that I was at actually. And that, that sort of gets you thinking about you really need like a community doesn't do it alone. 
right? And having all that that is collaborative conservation too, right? We just, we often don't use the term in the context of the, in which I work, but in some of the classes I've been giving lately, a lot of people are bringing up more and more, but where do these other stakeholders fit? How do they, you know, and I think they fit under that collaborative conservation rather, because when we say community, people think only about communities, but they're never doing it alone, right? It takes so much support. We should use it more in all these other contexts than we, you know, more than we do. Thank you, Dr. Alan Dorf. And thank you, Dr. Sanderson, as well. Um, that. Uh, so just uh, staying with you, Dr. Sanderson, why do you think collaboration in conservation is important? It's a great question. And I, you know, I'll reflect a little bit on my career. Um, so I was, um, I got my first um, training in conservation and my first experience actually in community-based conservation Back in the 1980s, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa working on um, uh, community-based um, forestry. And um, it was, um, the program was kind of a complete disaster um, because it was imposed by the federal government and it was imposed by um, uh, NGOs that most definitely did not think about putting that locus of power in the communities. And, and so, but then continuing on from there, my stints through graduate school, I was very much trained in what I refer to as 20th century conservation, um, which um, at least in the North American model, and I think this applied in, in a lot of other parts of the world as well at that time, where nature protection was about identifying natural areas, I'll put that kind of in air quotes, natural areas that we set aside and we protect them and people mostly stay out of them. And I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that particular tool of setting aside preserves and national parks. I think that's still important. Um, but at the same time, I would argue that De empirically speaking, if we look at the data and the trends of wildlife across uh, the globe, um, we're we're not we're we're losing. You know, the trends are still mostly down, and so that model that we used um, is, is one I think empirically speaking not succeeding. It's succeeding in some places, but on balance. Um, we're still not ahead of this this uh, challenge of biodiversity loss. But I'm, what we've seen in a lot of parts of the world is that that approach to conservation, that 20th century model of setting nature apart from people in communities has created a lot of divisions. And like here in the United States, I can say that back in the 1970s and late 60s, when we and when we passed a lot of our um, really um, uh, most advanced species environmental protection laws, like our Endangered Species Act, um, those were done with has become um, as politically divisive as um, as any other issue, and. I believe very deeply that we simply cannot succeed at, at, at the scale at which we need to succeed with conservation if it's a political issue. I, I really deeply believe we have to have everyone on board um, if we're going to succeed with conservation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Sanderson. That's very interesting. Uh, so, Dr. Allendorf, based on your person, experience implementing collaborative conservation? Um, challenges. So let's see. So I'll just add that I was also Peace Corps um, in Nepal. So <laughs> some common roots there, I think, probably in how we got interested in, in conservation and thinking about the way we do. Um, and Nepal, I was lucky because Nepal is an example where it truly does work, right? And the trends are all upwards. There's more forest, there's more wildlife, there's more tiger. I mean, it's amazing. And they have different models for the protected areas, community forests, but they all work. There's always a glass half full, like in all of what they've done. There's a glass half empty too, right? We can look at it both ways, but 
globally speaking, it's a great model, um, but there are still challenges. So to bring us back to the question of challenges. So even in Nepal, where they are, you know, have done such an amazing job with communities and conservation, the challenge are the same there as they are anywhere, right, is, is full participation, right, from anyone who might want to participate, right? So if you walk, I always say there's a conservationist in every village, but you've got to give them a chance somehow and you have to reach them, right? And I think this is true whether you're talking a village or a department or an agency or a university or wherever involved in conservation and learn more. And so in Nepal, for example, with marginalized or, or women, there's a lot of effort to try and include them, but it can be difficult, right? There's a lot of challenges, but a lot of time the challenges are quite simple in that we're not even asking people, right? We're not giving them the opportunity because we sort of bring in our assumptions. So an anecdote from Malaysia a couple of years ago, right before COVID hit, I was in Malaysia for the first time working with a master's student who was working with two longhouses there. And she really wanted to start involving women. She'd been working there for three years. She'd only worked with a few men to do some camera trapping as part of her project in a protected area. And she wanted to include women. And she's like, but what do I do? How do I do it? They're so busy. They've got a lot of responsibilities. Are they going to be interested? And I said, well, let's just ask them, right? Let's just say, do you, would you be interested in learning how to camera trap? And we can just do like a one or two day training right now. And they're like, yes, why didn't you ask us two or three years ago? And it's interesting too, because the motivations of people are really diverse, right? So when we ask them, you know, why are you interested? I mean, they both want to learn and they want to experience new things, but it's also economic benefits, right? So I tend to not emphasize the economics at first, because when you're talking conservation, people do in every community, they have a vested interest in having what I call more of a better quality of life, right? Before you even start talking money, right? People want to conserve for various reasons, but these women for them too, is also partly monetary because the way the camera trapping had worked is the men got paid. And when the man wasn't there, as the, as the work rotated through the longhouse, if the husband wasn't there, then that family wouldn't get the money from that. So they're also motivated to participate in, in making some of the money. So it was just a really interesting example of how. And it's funny, too, because in the U.S., we talk about women with a glass ceiling, right? And we, there's sort of a lot of assumptions about women wanting to work or how they want to work when they have children at home. And there's this one well-known book, and the, their, uh, their conclusion was just ask women. I mean, just ask people, right? Just ask them anywhere in any context. Do you want this position? Do you want this job? Do you want to do this work? Um, and I think that's just a good lesson. And then recognizing all that there are all challenges on top of that. People may want to participate, but there's a lot of things that can limit their ability to do that. And part of our job as conservationists, right, working with communities is to help them overcome that. So another example from Nepal, I was with... Um, They've got these community-based anti-poaching units that a lot of, it's mainly women, you know, people in their 20s and 30s and a lot of women have joined and they were talking about going out to do the rhino count in the annual census one year. And I was there and the warden was like, well, the women can't go because we just don't have enough tents. We don't have, we've only got one female ranger. She can't necessarily make it. So we can't have women in the field, right? That's just gonna be too complicated. And then one of the nonprofit people, and maybe because it's, I was there, who knows, right? There's an NGO leader who said, no, no, we can make this work. So. You know, he's like, we will get that female ranger. We'll make sure we've got some staff who can accompany so that the women can be included, right? So again, it's it's gotta be collaborative, right? We've all got to sort of stand up and find ways to overcome challenges and just let, give people opportunities to participate. So I think, I mean, there's a lot of challenges, right? But just to keep it down at the, you know, sort of community level examples, I'll, I'll stop there, but there's yeah, many, many challenges. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Allendorf. Um, and thank you for touching on those challenges. I think that was really inspiring to hear about, you know, in terms of um, the experiences that you've had. Uh, so just moving on from, from that and carrying on, Dr. Sanderson, as you know, engaging with local communities is an important aspect of collaboration. Uh, so in your experience, what insights did you gain when engaging with local communities? Uh, sure, that, you know, and I'd love to build a little bit on what what Terry's saying. And my, my experience is, you know, most throughout most of my career has actually been quite different from from Terry's. And I'm I'm really appreciating hearing, especially the um, your enthusiastic um, uh, descriptions of of the successes you've seen in Nepal. Um, I, you know, I've seen. Uh, certainly plenty of, of successes here, even right here in Colorado, where I've spent most of my career. Um, but boy, we still have some real serious challenges as well around um, uh, not sauce, but, uh, but habitat change, where we're grappling with wildfires and drought um, and, um, 
And so we're, you know, we've had some successes, some half full scenarios, but then um, uh, some real challenges that we're still continuing to face. Um, Terry, I'd be, you know, I'd be curious for your thoughts on um, one observation I've made as well uh, to this question of, of engaging with local communities. Um, what I hear you describing is that somebody is bringing a lens to this conversation that is looking at process from sort of a, 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 um, a more comprehensive picture, if you will. Um, and I'm particularly interested in sort of the cultural dimensions of this as well. And an observation I've made about the cultural dimensions is that you know, so I worked for uh, a while in West Africa. My experience overseas is actually pretty limited to early in my career. But um, when I was in West Africa, um, it was really obvious that there are cultural differences because I'm a white male working in a community that is uh, that is um, Black African and uh, speaking a different language from what I speak with very different cultural norms and so forth. Um, but then I come back to Colorado, and if I go down to Southeast Colorado, a very rural part of the state that's very conservative, the people actually look like me and they speak the same language, but culturally it's very, very different. And and I would say one of the, one of the lenses that that I feel like I've, I'll say a couple things specifically about engaging with, with local communities. One is that it really, really helps to have somebody who's bringing that lens that Terry just described, which is really thinking, how do we be inclusive? How do we structure a process that might actually rub up against some of the, of the community norms? that are in place but how can we be creative how can we think about engaging all of the interests you know we've talked about gender but um but there are other there are other dimensions of 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 uh, community engagement that might also um need a different kind of representation in the um in the process terry also mentioned youth and the importance of of tapping into the youth so you know, somebody who's really thinking about process and and I would suggest as well, somebody that does not have their own agenda. And so um, I refer to this as a third party neutral, somebody who can come in and really think just about process and then work with the community to both understand the community needs and, um, uh, um, but then also, um, you know, help to shape the process so that it can be really inclusive and effective. So, so having somebody process oriented, I think is really important. But another insight, something that I use all the time here that I consider a bedrock principle of the work that, that we do is working through relationships. And so, um, you know, for me to just come in and sort of, you know, for me to lead the process I'm not going to, when I step into a community, I'm not going to have the credibility that, that I need and the trust that I need to be able to lead that process. So one thing I like to do is really identify who are the leaders in the community that I can work with, um, who can then represent this process and, and, and help us shape a process that, that's really effective. These leaders being hopefully individuals who are already, you know, they really understand the community, they understand the norms, they're trusted um, throughout the community and so forth. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sanderson. I think as you mentioned, you know, being creative and pushing the boundaries is so important when it comes to engaging with communities. So thank you so much for that insight. Uh, Dr. Allendorf, how do different stakeholders influence collaborative conservation and what role do they play in your opinion? <laughs> uh, okay, say it again once more. Sure. So how do, you, how do different stakeholders influence collaborative conservation and what role do you think they would play? 
which is a huge question because, you know, when you're talking different stakeholders, whether again, maybe I'll just use a community as an example, but it expands out to all those potential collaborators in the process, right? But even within a community, like John said, you'll find leaders of all stripes, right? There may be leaders who want to support some kind of natural resource conservation mission or biodiversity or species specific. And there'll be leaders who maybe emphasize different things, right? So you've got gatekeepers and leaders. And so even within one small rural community, you will have people all over the map in terms of their main interests, their main, the things, how they perceive their own role in the community. And that obviously influences everything that you do, right? Either positively or negatively. And like John, I mean, excellent summary there of sort of process and relationships, right? And how key those are. Um, and I think the one thing I would add in terms of thinking about how you influence people is that you do find those leaders, but like, so we go in thinking about process and relationships and trying to form those with being totally transparent about why we're there, right? Like our agenda is conservation. And there's usually someone in the community who also either has that as an agenda or, so I've seen either people are truly interested in biodiversity already. Maybe there's someone who's already, you know, some background for whatever reason, or they see their own resources degrading, right? So they're very interested in finding out how they can more sustainably manage their resources, or they're just interested in learning more. Like if you start talking about species and you, you know, people don't always know in their own context how rare what they have is, like they can be very proud of it and, and appreciate it, but really still not know the global context and just be blown away when they learn how precious what they have really is. So, I mean, you're working through that process and relationships, trying to establish that sort of the knowledge and the capacity in the community. And then there's always people who also and the natural resources and biodiversity. So that's another group of people almost, right? So you'll find all these different people in the community who are trying to either help their community or, and it's a matter of, you know, forming those relationships and helping that process along in a way. I mean, in the end, they may not come out exactly where we want people to be in terms of our own biodiversity beliefs, right? And where we think they should be going, but that's why that process and relationship is so important, right? You're trying to give them the locus of power to make those decisions, but to also have the capacity and knowledge to make those decisions and to have those discussions in their own community. A lot of times, like in a place like Nepal, where development is just, you know, and age development projects and NGOs, and like, there's just so much. The first thing people are thinking about um, is sort of like, what are you going to bring to our community, right? What can you bring? And we're trying to sort of flip that and get them to have that conversation amongst themselves. What are you guys valuing? What's important, right? It's not just about economic benefits from conservation even, right? Even the NGO, like WWF, they'll TN, they'll go in and they'll be like, we have to give people economic benefits so they won't be interested, right? And it's even said almost as a bribe sometimes, right? Well, we have to gain their trust to do what we want. We've got to give them some economic benefits because they're poor. And that just, that's not what you see in the community to get them having really good conversations about where they want to go with their communities, right? Like there's conversations about health and the environment and education, right? There's all these conversations. It's not just about economies, right? And, and economic benefits. So there's a, there's a lot to say there and I could go on for a long time, but, um, but in terms of different stakeholders, right? You are trying to bring all those people together to have real conversations based on actual, you know, capacity and knowledge to have them, you know, at whatever scale. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Allendorf. Um, staying with you, uh, in your experience, what are the important attributes that could lead to successful collaborative conservation? Attributes of anything or of the process? Yes. About the process, yes. Yeah, so that would eventually lead to successful collaborative conservation. Mm -hmm. Um, there's obviously a lot of different ways to answer that. I mean, again, getting back to like capacity and knowledge, some key foundational principles um, of what a group of people needs to to do collaborative conservation right and people do need access to a lot of skills and capacities and knowledge and and that's one thing that you know these outside groups can help to bring even though we are an outsider perspective right we can help facilitate that um, so yeah so attributes is hard because that, that question is kind of big it can mean a lot of different things so thank you so much for your insight I'd like to delve into what we could use to engage with stakeholders. So having met you and spoken about this in person, Dr. Sanderson, I know you are 
very passionate about this topic. So could you tell us about different methods and approaches that we could use to foster participation and engagement with stakeholders? Uh, yeah, sure. You know, I think Terry's already um, touched on this uh, quite a bit um, in, in uh, uh, several of the really important principles. And, and Terry, I really like the point that you're making that um, it's, um, I mean, economics matter, right? So we, I mean, we all have to, we're all trying to take care of our families and put food on the table and, and have shelter and safety and all of that. So that, that stuff, that stuff all matters, but I, I couldn't agree more with, with Terry's point that by, by leading with economics and just assuming that, oh, if we, you know, if we, if we pay them, everything's going to be uh, okay. And uh, boy, you know, speaking again to my, to my uh, uh, wolf example here in Colorado, and Simran, I, I know you and I have, have talked about this um, when you were here uh, a month ago, that, um, you know, the, the uh, ranchers I work with, the livestock producers I work with, they actually get quite offended when you lead with economics because they're like, look, this isn't about economics. Uh, I mean, it is about economics, of course. You know, they're trying to make a living and they, they, their livelihood feels threatened. But at the same time, I've had uh, somebody describe to me the, the power and meaning of, you know, so a calf is born and the mama dies during birth and they bring that calf into their kitchen and bottle feed it. Um, in order to help that calf through its first uh, days and weeks of life. And, and so, you know, they have a real attachment to this animal. They have a real attachment to this way of being on the land. And, um, and, and so when, when we who are not part of that community talk about it in purely economic terms, um, then it, it feels offensive. Um, and so I think so around participatory methods, one thing I emphasize, like to emphasize over and over again is, you know, it's so, so, so very important to, uh, to know how to ask good questions and how to listen to those answers. And, um, and so in listening to the answers, you can start to uncover um, what it is that's most important to the stakeholders that you're working with. Um, and so uh, community listening sessions, I do a lot of one-on-ones thinking about, you know, where is the space in which people will be comfortable to really um, to, to share what, what they need. And there's a whole art around the facilitation of those discussions. Some of them are one-on-ones, you know, in places where there are big gender divides, it might be valuable to have a different conversation with, with a group of women than you're having with a group of men. And, um, and, and, and there are a number of techniques that are about facilitation and participatory methods where one can, you know, really build trust in, uh, in the dialogue and trust in each other um, so that so that one can really, to begin with, pull out what's most important and critically, what are the shared values across all of the stakeholders that you're working with and focusing on those shared values. Um, and then once with, with that more solid understanding of, of what the values are and what's most important to the community as a whole and the individuals with that, within that community, then you can start really understanding where the solutions might lie and the path forward might, might be. Thank you, Dr. Sanderson. Uh, Dr. Allendorf, how do we evaluate the effectiveness of participatory methods in the context of collaborative conservation? Um, again, a very broad question, and it sort of depends if you're thinking of it from a project perspective, there'd be a lot of different ways of doing that, right, depending on your goals for that project. I mean, I think ultimately it's the community that you really want to have them thinking, right, that, that, it's, that it's successful. 
right? And so that's part of building their capacity to actually lead the projects, to do the conservation, to decide the indicators themselves of what's important, to recognize what is making them effective or not. Um, so yeah, again, a very broad, a broad question. I'm trying to think of, um, you know, like, so places like Nepal, you're looking at thinking, you know, do you have the right participation? Do you have 30% women? Do you have 30% marginalized, right? I mean, those are actually some key indicators that have sort of been thrown out there arbitrarily, but then you have, um, um, you know, Bina Agarwal doing research saying, no, this really makes a difference, right? If you have 30 to 50% women in a conversation, they can start to sway things, right? We can see that across different contexts, whether politics in the US or community meetings in Nepal, right? Having a certain number of, of people will make it effective. So um, yeah, I'll just throw that out as one example. And Thank Simran, you. can I can I yes. can I respond briefly to that question as well? Two sure. things: one, that you know the the data on leadership are really clear that women are better leaders on average than men, <laughs> and so I wanted to throw that out as well. You know, this thirty to fifty percent threshold—that's fantastic. But um, this, you know, having having um, women present in the conversation. And I know in some contexts that can be really, really difficult, including here in in rural Colorado, which is still, you know, in a ranching community, um, there's still a, a pretty powerful gender imbalance in, in who's making decisions and who's running operations and so forth. So that gender piece is really important. But the other thing I wanted to say about um, evaluating the effectiveness is that most collaborative conservation efforts, and we... Uh, a group out of the CCC did a study that was published about a year ago looking at collaborative conservation um, projects in, the, in North America and the United States in particular, and found that only about 15% even measured and reported what they were doing. And so can't emphasize enough that paying attention to what is defining what is success and thinking through how is one going to understand whether or not you're achieving that success and then reporting on that as well. I mean, it's a super important question to, to think about effectiveness of both the participatory process, are women involved, but then also what are you actually trying to achieve on the ground and are you having success there as well? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sanderson. I think that's really interesting, um, you know, to bring that up as well. Um, so moving forward, Dr. Allendorf, how do we improve our efforts in engaging with conservation management and policy in the context of collaborative conservation? Um, what tools do you think we should implement with to uh, foster long-term engagement? Um, say it again. Sure. There's just so many elements in each of these questions to think about, so many different ways to approach it. Sure. So um, just trying to understand, you know, how do we improve our efforts in engaging with conservation management and policy? And what tools do you think we should implement to foster long term engagement? So yes, on the biggest scale, thinking about all the conservation in the world, I think moving the power to more groups of stakeholders, specifically communities, right? Like overall, when you look at the numbers of indigenous people who don't have any actual sort of ability to manage their natural resources and the amount of land that can cover, I mean, just emphasizing more the capacity and knowledge of local communities, right? Both helping to build it, but also recognizing what's already there and how much is already being done by local communities. So even in Nepal, where there's so much, 30% of the forest in Nepal is already under community conservation officially, under community forestry, but there's still communities who will do it even without any formal recognition just on their own, right, before they even get certified or anything, right? So just really, really, you know, respecting and acknowledging how this really is going to be a group effort um, from all aspects right all all peoples trying to like I said give everyone an opportunity give them capacity to participate um and that sounds really simple and everyone talks about doing community stuff right almost any project you read will use the word communities in there but then we also really looking at what do they what does someone mean when they're saying collaborative or community who are they actually including how are they including them um who's getting you know the benefits of whatever type economic 
knowledge, trainings, right, skills, who's actually benefiting. When I did actually on my, my own personal website, I sort of put up an audit where I've said, okay, I've looked at action plans for species in Nepal because they've got these nice action plans for specific species where they actually list what they think they need in terms of money and activities. So it's not that they've done it necessarily, but they've got a plan. And I sort of went through and said, well, how, met, how much of this money is actually going to communities to build their knowledge or capacity or to, to you know, help them actually manage something versus like awareness, right? Or, or some kind of livelihood, training women how to sew or something. So there's like community related things versus actually community led, community based, right? And if we all sort of think more deeply about how are we really helping this individual or this community or this stakeholder or this government agency actually increase their own ability to understand how important biodiversity is to our survival and integrate that into what they're doing, whether they're working in the health department even, right? Even health and, and the environment are so closely linked. So I think just that, that big picture can be really helpful. And of course, then again, you can go through all sorts of scales and think how we as individual researchers. So often I think even individual researchers, we afraid if you're a student out in the field studying otters in India, right? So I, when I was doing that training uh, with WCS and on how they could incorporate more humans into what they were doing. So even if they're doing a really classic ecological study or, or population study, so I used otters as an example, and the student was like, but how do I actually involve the communities? Like, I'm not really working with them. I'm not really doing, I'm just sort of studying the otter. I'm like, well, just talk to the communities. When you're out there, they wanna learn, they know what you're doing, right? Don't be afraid to just describe what you're doing and be excited about, what you're doing because people want to learn from you. They do want to learn what you're doing. They want all species too. Maybe they see it all the time, but they don't, again, they don't know that much about it. And you know so much. So I just think at all, at all levels, we can all be contributing. Even if you don't want to work with humans, you don't want to work with communities. You're a traditional ecologist. You still have so much to share with people, right? Just your excitement and knowledge. So yeah, that would be my, my kind of spiel, I think, for all of us just being more excited about natural resources and communities in general and sharing that. Thank you so much, Dr. Andorf. I think you captured that so well, you know, in terms of even thinking about the big picture. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sanderson, um, coming to you regarding, uh, you know, as people, biodiversity and endangered species face serious threats, um, what disciplines and concepts do you think we should engage with when focusing on policies and strategies that address the involvement of stakeholders? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, so a couple of things that that come to mind, um, you know, the so the I spoke a bit earlier about um, the the intersection between um, uh, the different scales of this conservation work, and I think you know when when policy gets set um whether it's whether it's at a um a state level or at the federal level or within a program like uh, US Agency for International Development or within a nonprofit for example uh in when when they when these large uh conservation organizations decide how they're going to be moving forward i think it's it's incumbent on uh, the people who are designing those laws, designing the policy, designing the, the strategies that the, the, um, that the nonprofits are going to employ to really become familiar with this topic and the, the, um, the core principle that, that Terry and I have been describing here about community engagement and inclusivity and things of that sort. So, you know, uh, using my Colorado-based example again, um, around this uh, uh, this reintroduction of a uh, of a top predator into Colorado, uh, there was explicit attention uh, paid to the process, and the law was written in a way that said very explicitly we're going to have this community engagement um, and so um, the, the law didn't specify the, the details of how that would work but um, but it did at least 
pay attention to the importance of that community engagement as opposed to the agents thing back and you know doing an internal process and then bringing that forward um so i think i think for for us to continue to i'll say proselytize around the importance of the whether we call it you know community-based conservation or collaborative conservation and there's other terms we could use as well to make sure that when we're designing policy across the scales um, that that we're incorporating these key principles into it the other thing i would say is that you know even though we don't want to lead with economics um the funding is really important and i would say in particular the funding in the uh in the process itself so uh we at the ccc we talk a lot about collaborative capacity so i was talking earlier about and terry was as well about um there's an individual who or a group of individuals who are really focused on the process well that that individual has to have both the skills to do it so they have to invest in in their own skills or the organization that they work for has to invest in their skills but then also um you know that that person needs to um have the resources to invest in that process um and and sometimes it's very hard to make that happen because uh organizations sometimes the funding organizations sometimes want to see you know the on the ground outcomes and they're willing to invest in in the uh in the tangible deliverables but less inclined to invest in uh in the people side of it that people capacity and organizational capacity side of the work and and we have to invest in both both in order to be successful with this work thank you dr sanders and i think that was really very interesting and staying with you actually dr sanderson what tools do you believe we should use to better understand the complexities of collaborative conservation is that for terry can we throw that to <laughs> sure i'm curious what what tools you use terry when you're thinking about entering in whether you're evaluating or trying to launch some some kind of community based conservation work tools we use well i mean to be specific about tools i mean it is it is a process like we were talking about right like you're going into a community with a process and specific tools with a community or any group in the facilitation i mean there's tons of manuals out there there's tons of things you can try with a community right there's so many different approaches i mean i like there's asset based community development along with appreciative inquiry and there's mapping right to get people on board and and looking at where their resources are um there's just so many different tools um that all are trying to do the same thing right in terms of trying to get people full up there to get them to participate um so in terms of tools there's no end of things to try right um made for village level there's a lot of manuals for village level development that are applicable to natural resources you know all the way up to high level agency conversations right tools for how to facilitate meetings breakout groups um right there's so many ways so many specific tools and and i mean it's a great question but i always try to say there's no one way to do it um and so another Another thing I always found interesting whether you're looking at like peace corps volunteers in countries or or researchers from universities or the head of USAID people walk in to a process and they uh that can some you had it is about their own character and personality figuring out a set of tools works and who they are. the same thing would be true of an organization right we're all going to have different personalities and characteristics and different sets of tools that we found that have that have worked to get us towards whatever the goal is so i always like to say i don't think there's any one perfect way to do anything right just because we're all different communities are all different they react differently to different things so um one one study i did looking at again to bring up gender as an example because i've done a lot of gender things and anecdotally it's it's a nice thing to use um So in in um Myanmar in Chatin Wildlife Sanctuary where we worked for a number of years and have longitudinal longitudinal data I compared the attitudes of men and women over a few year period 
based on what had changed in terms of management, where management had started to reach out to communities. So we had sort of a baseline before there was much work with communities and then, uh, and then after five or seven years or so. And we found that, you know, men and women reacted very differently to the types of outreach and the types of tools that were being used, right? And I looked, I sort of looked it up and in social media or in um, communications literature, they talk about how women tend to react positive, they tend to react more to positive messages about things, right? So, and then even watching the news on TV or something, if it's something positive, women will engage and listen more. Whereas men will engage and listen more to a problem, to something full of conflict. Um, and we can sort of see that in our data, like the men were, were focused more on, I mean, partly because the men's baseline, men tend to know more about um, positive benefits of natural resources than women. So it's kind of a complicated topic, but the men sort of start out already appreciating that the environment gives you fresh water, it gives you fertilizer, right? So when you're dealing with men and changing their attitudes over time through management, they were focused more on conflicts and mitigating conflicts, whereas women knew less of they tend to, in many studies, know less about the environment because they're not as formally educated. They don't get to go to community meetings and learn from the you know, national park you know, resources about why a national park is important. So they had a lot of room to just get more positive in terms of understanding um, you know, uh, ecosystem services and things. But in general, we saw that. You know, so different tools, the point is, I guess, different tools will work differently, right? So different groups of people, you've got to think about what tool is going to work the best. How does this group interact with each other? What, what resonates with them? Which, again, is sort of... So it's again sort of letting communities lead, but also providing capacity and ideas for them to pick up on and go, oh, we want to try that. Oh, that's interesting. You know, you're bringing in sort of outside experiences or lessons, but also trying to work within their own context and what gets them motivated. So a uh, complicated answer to a simple question about tools, but yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Allendorf. Uh, Dr. Sanderson, would you like to share your thoughts on this with us? Yeah, well, I um, I very much um, concur with this um, with with Terry's point that there are a lot of tools available, um, and we actually have. If anyone's interested, we have uh, we have a actually a page on our website. I'll we'll actually put it in the chat if anyone wants to check this out, where we uh, we list um, a number of of categories around you know, what is collaboration and how do you sustain partnerships and how do you evaluate, how do you facilitate? I put that link in the chat and um, it's not, I can't claim by any means that that's uh, a comprehensive list, um, but, um, but it's, uh, it's some tools that, that we've run across here that we find valuable. Um, if you all have any others that, uh, and anyone who's tuning in today, has any others that I should know about that you find super valuable, then, uh, then please uh, let me know. I can actually put my uh, email in the, in the chat as well if you wanna uh, drop me a note. Um, but um, these tools are available. There are systematic approaches to uh, a whole range of things that we've talked about. Um, couldn't agree more that you know, the, the specific context can really matter and there's no one tool, there's no one approach that, that is the right approach. Personality matters, context matters. And at the same time, there are, um, you know, there are some things that are like basically human. Um, there are ecological principles that, that apply uh, across the whole range of communities in which we work. Simran, when you were here, we were talking about the, the similarities between the elephant ag conflicts that you all experience uh, in Southern India. And we have a similar thing with wolves and ag here in Colorado. So, you know, the, the specifics of the cultural um, context and, and the way we interact and and, and how we process can, can vary depending on that context. But, um, but at the same time, you know, um, most of us care about the environment at some level. Most of us care about uh, nature at some level. All of us want to take care of our families. All of us need to meet our basic economic needs. Um, and so, um, so finding that, that, that mix of general principles 
and then the specific applications in the context. There, there are a number of tools that we can use. Um, the one, one we haven't mentioned, although we've sort of alluded to it, that I think is pretty interesting is that there are, oh, there are ways to evaluate um, the depth of your community engagement. And I encourage use of that as well, because we're actually doing that with our CCC fellows uh, in this conversation, Simran was part of a, a month ago, where we we talk about the the ladder of engagement, or um, uh, when we talk about research, there are there's a whole range of of how one can do research, ranging from you know I go into a place and I almost don't communicate with the community at all. I do my wildlife research and then I deliver the results. Um, and, and that's the, the lowest level of community engagement. And then at the other end of the spectrum, one can actually deeply involve the community, even in something like wildlife research, let alone conservation. And there are tools around that as well, and certainly frameworks to think about that you can take back to your own work and think about to what extent are you engaging the community in the work that you're doing. Thank you, Dr. Sanderson, and thank you so much, Dr. Allendorf. It's been a really engaging discussion. Uh, we will now take questions from the audience um, who sent them to us. And we've actually received a question uh, from the audience. And one of, our mem one of our viewers would like to know about ease and complexities of collaboration in biodiversity conservation. Um, are there any major differences seen pre-pandemic and post-pandemic in the context of sharing research data and other resources like funds. Uh, so um, Dr. Allendorf, would you like to go first and share your thoughts with us? So this is thinking pre and post COVID, what's changed in terms of? Uh, in terms of sharing research data and other resources like funds in the context of collaborative conservation. Um, well, the first, Thing that pops into mind is just in terms of everyone getting more used to communicating virtually like this right like i'm sitting out on public lands in colorado doing this panel which probably two years ago i wouldn't have even have thought about right and now we're just so second nature and i saw this happen again in nepal um, and i think everywhere you're seeing that you can now have these meetings with the head of a community forest user group right or different people in a buffer zone right we're able to communicate so much more easily and share and share things that way right so that would be the most obvious in terms of funding i mean a lot of stuff is still falling out right we're not really post covid um projects are really just sort of beginning again in some places right so i don't know if it's really clear yet other than that to me what some of the differences are going to be john what do you think yeah, I would love to uh, give a shout out to the Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, and, you know, uh, there was a, um, a paper by Francine Madden, I can't remember the second author, about five years ago that, that really made the case that um, often the problems that we need to invest in to solve a conservation problem don't actually look like a conservation problem. And so about a year ago or more, CWS um, recognized that um, in the context of, of the pandemic, that um, community-based health services were really, really hurting. And so there was a global push to raise money. Uh, my family contributed a little bit, and I know folks did from across the globe to give money to CWS to be able to invest in the community-based health services that were so critically important and continue to be really important. And, you know, I wanna give a shout out to CWS for recognizing the importance of that. And even though, you know, community health doesn't look explicitly like biodiversity protection, but the health of the community is vitally important to get to that biodiversity protection. So, um, yeah, so kudos to, to you all for, for taking that initiative. Thank you so much for your kind words, Dr. Sanderson, really appreciate it. And um, thank you, Dr. Allendorf as well. It's been a really engaging discussion. 
Uh, but as we're running out of time, we will have to conclude our webinar today. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our esteemed panelists, Dr. Sanderson from the Center for Collaborative Conservation, CCC, can be reached at um, collaborativeconservation.org. And um, Dr. Terry Allendorf can be reached at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, under the, the Center for South Asia section of their website. Um, so thank you both for adding great insight to our discussion today and taking the time out and participating in um, a really insightful conversation. Um, I hope all of you in the audience uh, enjoyed our CWS Wildlife Chronicles webinar. Uh, to know more about us or get involved in our organization, you can write to us at outreach at the rate of cwsindia.org. Uh, thank you so much once again, and we'll see you at our next CWS Wildlife Chronicles webinar.